Hello and welcome. In this educational aid, we're going to talk about the classical orbital elements, or COEs. The COEs gives us a practical way of understanding the characteristics of an orbit and a satellite's location at any given time. Orbits come in all shapes and sizes. Some are small and circular, others are quite large and highly elliptical. Despite these differences, we can define an orbit by its orbital elements. The COEs describe orbit size, orbit shape, orbit tilt, orbit twist, orbit rotation, and satellite's location. This table lists each of the COEs and relates them to their effect on the orbital geometry. The first COE is semi-major axis, which tells us the size of the orbit, depicted with the letter A. To help you better understand what semi-major axis is, we first must cover two terms, perigee and apogee. Recall from the Kepler educational aid that periapsis is the point on the orbit where it's closest to its orbiting body and apiapsis is the point on the orbit where it's furthest from its orbiting body. So perigee is the point on the satellite's orbit where it's closest to the Earth, and it's also where the satellite is traveling the fastest. Apogee is the opposite of perigee. It is the point on the satellite's orbit where the satellite is furthest from the Earth. It's also the point where the satellite is traveling the slowest. Therefore, semi-major axis is defined as the average of the two distances, perigee and apogee but this can be more simply stated as just half the major axis, where the major axis is the distance from apogee to perigee. So semi-major axis tells us the size of the orbit. Here are some examples of circular orbits with semi-major axis of varying sizes. The second COE is eccentricity, which tells us the shape of the orbit, depicted with the letter E. Kepler's first law told us that all orbits are ellipses, either a circle, an ellipse, or some part of one. Here's a sampling of orbits with various values of eccentricity, ranging from zero to just under one. Eccentricity can be one or higher, but the orbit would no longer be orbiting the Earth. It is important to state that eccentricity only tells how round or flat the orbit is. You can have orbits with different semi-major axes, but the same eccentricity. And you can have satellite orbits with the same semi-major axis, but different eccentricity. Again, the semi-major axis tells us the size of the orbit, and eccentricity tells us the shape of the orbit. In this example, you can also see varying eccentricities and what it does to an orbit shape. Note, the closer eccentricity gets to one, the flatter the orbit becomes. The next COE is inclination. Inclination is depicted with the letter I and is used to describe the tilt of the orbit. Inclination is measured from the equatorial plane to the orbital plane. The equatorial plane is a plane that goes through the center of the Earth and extends out through the equator. The orbital plane is a plane that lays flat on top of the orbit and extends through the center of the Earth. Inclination ranges from 0 to 180 degrees. If the inclination is between 0 and 90 degrees, the orbit is said to be prograde or direct moving in the direction of Earth's rotation. However, if the inclination is between 90 and 180 degrees, the satellite is said to be retrograde or indirect, going against the direction of Earth's rotation. If the inclination is exactly 90 degrees, the orbit is polar. The next COE is right ascension of the ascending node, or RAN, also called longitude of ascending node, depicted with the Greek letter omega or cap omega. RAN measures orbital twist and identifies where in the orbit the satellite rises up through the equatorial plane. Since the Earth and the satellite both move and rotate, we must measure the ascending node from a point that is stationary or fixed. To do this, we use the vernal equinox direction. The vernal equinox direction is a line or a vector from the center of the Earth through the center of the Sun on the first day of spring. So RAN is measured from the vernal equinox direction to the ascending node. After RAN, the next COE is argument of perigee, depicted with the Greek letter omega, or little omega. 
argument of perigee measures orbital rotation or location of perigee in the orbit. Perigee location is measured in degrees in the direction of satellite motion from the ascending node to perigee. Recall that perigee is where in the orbit that the satellite is closest to the Earth and kinetic energy is at its maximum. While the first five COEs tell us something about the orbit, the last COE is all about the satellite. This COE is true anomaly, depicted with the Greek letter nu. True anomaly tells us where in the orbit the satellite is located and is measured in degrees from the orbit's perigee to the satellite's location. Just because the six COEs have been identified does not mean we can determine where the satellite is within its orbit. Yes, True anomaly tells us where the satellite is located, but we need time to know when it will be there or when it was there. COEs are valid for a particular time. Since the satellite is always moving, true anomaly is always changing. Knowing the time COEs are valid not only allows us to determine where the satellite is or was, but where it would be in the future. If you know the six COEs and the time the COEs are accurate for, you can determine when the satellite would be overhead. For example, imagine you are on the ground at noon local, and the satellite you're interested in just passed overhead. You can determine when is the next time you would have access or visibility to that satellite. This is useful because each satellite provides a mission such as observation, communication, data relay, or navigation. For a satellite user, knowing when you can take advantage of or use a satellite is of the utmost importance. Knowing these classical orbital elements we can see how they are used in real application. Here you can see a two-line element set. Two-line element sets, or TLEs, are used throughout the space industry to list the COEs in a standard manner. Let's look at the TLE a little closer. In the far left of each line, we have the numbers 1 and 2. This is the line identifier, and thus we have a two-line element set. Now, starting across the top line from left to right, we will cover some of the important information listed in the TLE, as well as the COEs. First is the catalog number. Everything that is tracked in space is given a number, so its data can be more easily managed. The first major information told in the TLE is epoch time. This is the time the element set or the COEs are accurate. Remember that we do not know when the COEs are accurate. We cannot predict when we'll have access to the satellite again. For this TLE, the time is in a two-digit year, a three-digit day, decimal, fraction of the day format, 17,352.664. So the epic time is the year 2017 on the 352nd day, or December 18th, at 4 p.m. Coordinated Universal Time. After epic time, we move down to the second line, and we have inclination. In this case, it is 51.6 degrees. So this object is somewhat inclined. Next is right ascension of the sending node, or RAN, and it's 198.7 degrees. Then keep moving to the right, we come to eccentricity. Because TLEs are for Earth orbiting objects, the eccentricity must be less than one, and therefore the decimal in front is assumed. And this object's eccentricity is point 0, 0, 0, 0003 degrees. Not a perfect circle, but pretty darn close. After eccentricity, we have argument of perigee, and it's 256.7 degrees. Then mean or true anomaly, the satellite's location for the given epoch time, 103.3 degrees. In TLEs, the semi-major axis is hidden in the next number called mean motion. For this TLE, mean motion is 15.5 revolutions per day. What this means is that the object will orbit the Earth 15.5 times in a day. With this knowledge, we can determine the period of the orbit by dividing 24 hours or 86,400 seconds by 15.5 revolutions per day, giving us a period of 5,574 seconds or roughly 93 minutes. Now using Kepler's third law, we can determine that the semi-major axis is 6,795 kilometers. You may have figured it out already, but if not, this is the TLE for the International Space Station. That is it on classical orbital elements. 
I am Jeremy Brown with the National Security Space Institute, and I hope you enjoyed this educational aid.